And last but not least. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Done. That is finished now. We oh, he didn't that. change the background. <laughs> we change it and we're all about to go. Grand. So yours is all. I'll give that to you. Okay. And I have this Hello. one here. Yes, you're live and kicking. I was okay. doing Halloween sounds yesterday, but... <laughs> yeah, no, don't do them now. Don't, don't do the Halloween sounds. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do the Halloween sounds now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of the evening. So let's... Yeah, just make sure we don't destroy lose the light. ourselves here. Um, but uh, it gives me pleasure now to introduce our final speaker, Mike Stapleton from Canada is a highly experienced genealogical researcher, a member of the Middlesex County, Ontario, Ontario Genealogical and Irish Genealogical Research Societies. And for more than two decades, he has conducted extensive research on the Irish Stapletons everywhere and Gleasons from Nina and the Silver Mines area in particular and how they ended up in Canada and what happened to them when they got there. So our last of our major emigrants is Mike Stapleton. Please give him a warm welcome. Dave, you got the... Uh... I'll get the clicker for you. Yes. But in the meantime, you can just do these ones here. Sure. And yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. This is a much younger me, by the way. I know you can't really see it, but that's a much younger me. I, just, I wanted to make sure I had one. That one there. <laughs> this person here. Uh, this is a story. Uh, I, I may I may try to speed this up a little bit, okay? Because I know that we're uh, we're way behind schedule. But uh, this is this is my family story. I've, I've never really told it before in front of an audience, uh, although I've, I've bored my own family to death uh, many times with it. And, uh, you, and anybody that has any, any family history uh, experience knows that uh, most of the people you, you, you want to talk to eventually start rolling their eyes backward after about five minutes. So uh, because we all have a tendency to run on about uh, the same names over and over again, and people don't aren't able to put them in the same context that we do. So I'm basically going to cover um, some some of the key things that family historians or genealogists have to deal with, and uh, because the big question for any emigrant or any anybody that's left their point of origin is you know, basically, where, where, did, where did we come from, why did we go, you know, and when did we go, and what did we do when we got there? So that's basically the, 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 the thread of this particular story. Unlike most aboriginal North Americans, which we aren't, okay, um, generally, there's three major historical conundrums. You know, who were my ancestors? In my case, they were James Stapleton and Margaret Gleason. And where did they come from? They came from Ireland. And when did they arrive? Which is basically how long have we been there? And we know that it was either in 1847 or 1848 or both because there's a family story that says they came in, in two groups. However, over the, the last 20 some odd years, I I've, I've really haven't been able to come to grips with that completely, but we'll see that as we, as we move along here. James and Margaret, okay, for, were from the parish of Yahalara, just uh, down, down the road here. They resided uh, in Ballyhiskey in uh, Burgess Parish, and uh, James was uh, identified on the, on the tithe appointments for 1829. And he was on uh, the, the further allotments from 1845 to 1848. And they leased land from the Finch family of Kilcolman. Now, one, uh, you, you, talk, you hear a lot of stories about, uh, about landlord and tenant relationships. But this is a, this is a little piece here from, from the Nina Guardian from 1843. James uh, Staple, Stapleton and, and his neighbor and friend Terence Boyle congratulated Mrs. Finch for 
actually reducing the rents for them in that particular year because 1843 was one of the earlier years of, of, of the famine and the, and the potato crop failed that year and obviously they weren't able to pay the full rents and there was there was a lot of land uh, you know there was a lot of agitation in Tipperary at, at that particular time and but it's, I, I guess it, it was probably good for Mrs. Finch to see that but they actually put it in the Nina Guardian. That's James Stapleton um, along with his brother-in-law Matt Gleason and likely his father-in-law Morty Gleason that uh, as they appeared on the 1830s uh, 30 tie of the plotments. Now James wasn't named as James, he was just named as Stapleton, but on the other documentation he shows his name as James shows up. This was their family. The, the, the father, mother, and their ten children were all born in Ballyhiskey, along with Michael O'Neill and Matthew's wife, also his first cousin, I might add, uh, they were all born in Belly Hiskey. So there was ten children, Tobias, John, my great-great-grandfather, or my great-grandfather, uh, his sister Mary, brother James, Patrick, Thomas, Matthew, Bridget, Martin, and Stephen. I won't spend a, a lot of time uh, talking about them in general, but they were the, they were the, the progenitors of, of our family. They all left and uh, they all stayed. Now, the, one of the interesting things about where in Ireland do we live, a, a lot of people that emigrate struggle for years trying to figure that out. And although it's getting a little easier today, in the, in the days when I got started, when <clears throat> everything was on microfilm or it was in a book or it was in some family lore somewhere, we were very, very lucky. There was the, one of the things that the Irish did in general was they seemed to have left a stamp when they, when, when, when they died, a lot of Irish in North America in particular, and, I, and, I, and I've seen it also in, uh, in Australia on, on, on tombstones, where they've left where they came on the stone. And for us, us that are lucky enough to have had this, it, it made life a lot easier to, to, to basically reconnect with where we came from. And as you can see, that the, on the bottom of that stone, it, it, says, it, it actually says, and it's hard to read, obviously, on, on that slide, it says the natives of the parish of Burgish County, Tipperary Island, Ireland. And, of course, Burgish is pretty close to the way uh, Burgess is, is said in Irish and uh, and the stone carver basically carved it the way he heard it so it was it was like all names you know it was phonetic now my my, my uh, great-grandfather when he passed away he was able to at least pass on the fact that oops, it was Burgess Parish not Burgish Parish. <laughs> now, where in Ballyhiskey did, did they live? Which is always a conundrum. You know, the, the, the kind of land records that we're used to today, where it basically places a house on a lot, you know, within a within some kind of a township, where in, within a city or, or wherever, and it's all surveyed. Of course, in in in, in Ireland in 1850 and, and before that sort of documentation doesn't really exist. So we have to we have to maybe use our imagination a little bit to do that. Now one one of the things that, that we have is we have a series of letters that, that were received um, from Ireland which were responses to letters that were sent to Ireland from at least one of our, our family members. Martin, one of the younger sons, seemed to have kept up a fairly a good correspondence with his Gleason cousins in Ballyhiskey. And uh, so you can see from this little inset that I, that I did here that in 1870, this letter from, his, from their cousin uh, Mary Gleason, they said that the house was still standing, but they're using it as a cattle barn. <laughs> 
and and because in those days you if 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 you took you had to take the the roof off you had to take the roof off a dwelling for it not to be taxed so if, if there was nobody living in it the first thing that happened was is the roof came off because it was no longer then subject to to the tithes So when we look at the Griffiths map for, uh, for, for 1850, there are, there are in, in, in one area of, of uh, the Ballyhiskey townland, it appears that there's, there's a group, of, there's a group of, of dwellings that are likely candidates for, for where we, we lived. Now this house here we know was 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 Thomas was Thomas O'Neill's and and uh, his wife Catherine Mar Marshall's house. Now Thomas's son Michael married Mary Stapleton in Detroit in 1855. Thomas and and uh, Thomas O'Neill and, and James Stapleton were very close friends. And we know that this, the, from the letters and, uh, that we have and for, the, for their positions on the various documents as they change through the years of the valuation, that the field that they, that they uh, were responsible for or, 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 or had leased was this one here. Now, I'll just change the sheet here. One, one of the, 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 if you've ever used the OSI, Website for for map uh, for map uh, trying to map out places in Ireland. One of the little tricks it has is is you can overlay the historical layers onto the current layers to see if there's any changes in the position of houses or whether it was a dwelling there at the time. And when you overlay the um, the, the the two maps you'll see that there's one building that is still there that was in the 1850, 1850 uh, Griffiths map that today John Grace uses uh, for storage that is a good possibility for the one that is mentioned in the letter. It's not conclusive evidence by any means, but it certainly makes a lot of sense. Because the, the, the Gleasons and Stapletons and, and the Neals all lived in very close proximity. The next question, why, why, why emigrate? And Goethe Moore, you know, the Great Famine. That, that, was the, that, that, was the, that was the emphasis for so many people, okay? Potato crop devastation basically left the countryside uh, Without a, a above, without a means of living, and you know, starvation leaves very few prospects for people. And we know that over a million million died, you know, within Ireland. So these dire economic conditions, destitute of families, and emigration became really the number one uh, of uh, uh, number one option for everybody. You know, and and, and you got you got to think of where where are you going to go? Well, you know, it's a you know the the land sometimes is greener on the other side, and and many many Irish went to America. They went they went to Australia. They went to New Zealand, but you know the biggest the biggest uh, group of people certainly went to America, and of course America in those days was, and as it is today for most Irish, is anywhere in North America, whether it was Canada or the United States, it didn't matter. It was just America. Um, and if you had money, you know, land ownership here was almost impossible for ordinary Irish. They, and, and the people here knew that those from the people that emigrated, and we, they didn't have email in those days, but they did have the post, and they used it quite regularly. So, so what happened in America was known here, either, either by the people uh, here, or there sending newspapers and and other documentation back here to inform the people. They're, 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 it's, it's amazing, you know. Given given the letters that that, that we've read and the le the letters in our family, the letters that I know of from other families, you know, those those mail packets that went back and forth between 
Europe and, and uh, North America, you know, carried a steady traffic of, of, of information, family information back and forth that kept everybody in tune with what was going on no matter where they went. And of course the pressure from family and friends, we talked about chain migration, these are, these are the enablers for chain migration. If, if, if little Johnny went with Mary and they were happy when they got there, then little Johnny and Mary told everybody else and, and next thing you know the rest of the family's coming. So not, not, knowing, uh, not knowing conclusively whether our family decided to go to Canada because somebody else was there, I don't know, but certainly there was many others that followed them. British North America, you know, <clears throat> British North America, of course, like Australia, was a series of colonies. And, uh, and from 1815, about 1850 to 1850, Canada was the primary destination of, of all, all Irish immigrants coming to America. And being the destination being the port of entry, not necessarily where they finally ended up. Because it was very, coming to Canada was actually the, the, the least expensive way of getting of getting to America, and once they got there, likely about ninety percent of the people then made secondary trips into the U.S. rather than stay in Canada for a lot of for a lot of reasons. Um, because what what happened was in those days most most Irish Irish ships that left from Ireland in particular, they would, they would go empty across, across to the British colonies, would pick up lumber and, and, and other natural resources, and then they would, come, they would come back full on the return trip. So in the days when they were, they, were, they, they finally realized during, during the famine in particular that this was a, a, a big opportunity to make a little extra cash for, the, for and pay for the ships, so they they were able to then charge relatively small fees for for the for the people to, to travel to North America, and it therefore became a lucrative business supplement for them, so that they could then increase their increase their revenues, and because really people were ballast on the on the on the, on the trip going overseas, and the major ports of uh, immigrant ports at the time were Quebec City, Halifax, and St. John in New Brunswick. These, and these are where they're located, to, if you didn't already know. This being the... Oops. The Gulf of St. Lawrence here. Most... The, the, Halifax, Halifax actually had, had a fair, fair number landed in Halifax because they were. It was very close, of course, to the to the eastern seaboard here. And anybody with the intention of going to Boston or, or, or generally they would land in Halifax or St. John. Anybody that was 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 going, wanted to get into New York State or to New York City in general would come from Quebec. Then they would take they would take follow the uh, the, 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 there's, there's several ways of getting there, but they would follow the, the Finger Lakes in, North, in, in New York State down, get onto the Hudson River, and then go either east or west, depending on which way they were going to go. Now, as I said earlier, family lore claims we came in two groups. However, the one piece of document we have, one piece of documentation we have is Matthew Stapleton's obituary. He was the last of the original guys to die. He, he passed away in uh, 1923, and he was born in 1931. Although he always claimed he was born in 19, or 1836 or 1837. Um, but in, in, his, in his, uh, obit, it claims that that they left Limerick on the 1st of April, 1847, and they landed in Hamilton in Wentworth County, Canada West, on the 24th of May, 1847. That would just about be an impossibility, given, given, given the state of sailing ships in those days. However, it's pretty close.
Here's, here's a couple of uh, articles or, uh, uh, from the advertising uh, the ships leaving Limerick in 1847. And it, and it clearly talks about ships that are owned by Francis, Francis Spate, or Francis Spite, uh, you know, a fairly large landowner in this area, and, and also a, uh, an import, big in the import and export business uh, to North America. And you'll see here, oh, I'll go back, I'll get used to this. His, his ship left on the, his, his sailing, sailing date was the 1st of April. I think I'll do, now I'll do this. I guess I gotta go to the other, oh, there it is, sorry. Now, the, this is the journey now from Limerick, Limerick to Quebec. Of course, shipboard life and, and, and books and, and yards of material have been written on, on, uh, on coffin ships and what happened to people when they emigrated. But generally, poor health on embarkation, overcrowding, seasickness, disease, poor food, unsafe drinking water, and bad weather did not make that journey very pleasant. It was 3,000 miles from Limerick to Quebec, and depending on winds and the captain's skill, it could take anywhere from 40 days to three months in a sailing ship to get there. The Jane Black departed Limerick on the 3rd of April, 1847, and arrived at the Gros Hill Quarantine Station on the 17th of May in 1847. She shipped with 425 steerage passengers, of which 13 died at sea and six died in the quarantine station later from ship's fever or typhus. <clears throat> and some of them uh, died as well from dysentery. There was 19 deaths in total. And this is where the, the story kind of blends together a little bit. Uh, so so if, you look, if, you look at, if you look at the dates on this, the, the, they, were supposed to, they were supposed to leave on the 1st of April, but they actually left on the, on the 3rd. They were, Matt said that they landed in Hamilton on the, 20, on the 24th. Well, they actually landed in the Port of Quebec on the 23rd. So, the, so having been passed down through two generations before they wrote his obituary, his family almost got it right. <laughs> Now this trip, of course, got shortened very shortly thereafter when, when, when steamships replaced the, 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 the sailing ships in 1850, and then that that uh, that that six week or that that three month trip then got reduced very quickly to three to four weeks. That's the basically the trip from from Ireland to Quebec, the 3,000 miles. This, this is the, the report that was written from the quarantine station regarding the Jane Black. Tim, Timothy Gordon, Gorman, who was, who was along with his brother were, were, uh, and other members of his family were, were sailors that, that sailed the ships owned by Francis Bate. And again, left Limerick on, on the uh, 3rd of April. And arrived on the 17th of uh, on the, arrived on the 17th of, of uh, April in 1847. Just a, a you know, it's a fairly well well known uh, picture of uh, of the interior of a of a ship, and uh, they were pretty well all the same. This one here. This one here is taken from a document that it's on the Limerick uh, archives or on the Limerick archives website. They've got an excellent, an excellent story there about Francis Bate and his efforts to rid himself of, of uh, not the, the 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 small farmers and and what he considered to be.
the uh, detritus that was that was living on his his land within uh, w within Limerick and in Burgess in County Tipperary. This is basically the, the, the journey again from Quebec to Hamilton. If, if everything went well, it would take eight days. It, and it was done on steamships in those days. There were steamships on, on, because this is, you know, Canada's got a lot of water, like Australia, only ours is all on the inside, not on the outside. And uh, so, so the, so the distance from Quebec to Montreal is 180 miles, Montreal to Kingston, 247, Kingston to Hamilton, 220, the total journey being 647 miles. And the, and the, and the, and the cost would have been 19 shillings for an adult. To, so, to, so the family had to have had enough money to pay for the passage from Ireland to uh, to Quebec, and then enough currency to pay for the trip from Quebec to Hamilton. I've never really done the, you know, the complete assessment of that, but it would certainly be several, you'd have to have 40 or 50 pounds to take a, a family of 10 people to, uh, to North America. They, they then went from, from Hamilton and purchased, they, they purchased land in Enniskillen Township in, in Lambton County. But the trail doesn't really pick up again, you know, for us, uh, you know, until, until they purchased their first land in Enniskillen Township. And that was in 18, it shows up in a rec, as a record in 1848. The, um, the, the transaction, the transaction for that, uh, for that mortgage, and it was, it, and the mortgage was taken up by my great grandfather. John Stapleton, and it was 11 November 1848. Um, and again, oral history states that uh, that they hired wagons and, and teams and teamsters to move themselves and their belongings from Hamilton to uh, to Lambton County. Now they would, have, you know, to pay for that, they would have had to, have, you know, and again, this is pure speculation. They would have had to. They they. they it says it says in in some of the documentation we've got, and it also says in the family lore that they didn't arrive in Enniskillen Township until 1850. So between the time that they embark or the time that they debarked in Hamilton and the time they left, they must have been doing something. So you can only assume that they were you know they were working as day laborers. They were they were trying to get enough money put together to put a down payment on a mortgage, and then they were somehow getting themselves together to move towards this property was that that, uh, that today is about an hour away by car or an hour and a half away by car which in those days probably would have taken them a week and this is this is the the journey as I say from from the head of Lake Ontario and Hamilton over to through London over to Enniskillen Township and, uh, and, and the Petrolia area. Today would be, well, it's about an hour from Hamilton to London by car, and then it's about 45 minutes from London to Petrolia by car today. Now, the first decade was, was not necessarily a, a happy one for them once they arrived. Although they did acquire land, they also s suffered the, the, the deaths of the first of their of, uh, two of their children. Their son Tobias is, is a is a, a bit of an anomaly in this in this uh, in this story. Family lore states again that uh, Tobias was smuggled out of Ireland in a barrel because he was in trouble with the the local with the local authorities. Would not be unusual, I guess, and given given the times. Uh, but you know, how do you corroborate that? Well, it wasn't until many years later when uh, when the records of the Nina sizes came up on uh, on the websites that uh, I was able to finally track down a record for a Tobias Stapleton and a Patrick Gleason that were that were 
accused of murder of another Patrick Gleason in 1843, and uh, but were acquitted of that crime. And Tobias, uh, you know, so so likely being the, this Tobias, because again, the the, the two stories are. A, there, there was only one Tobias that I know of in this area at that particular time. So uh, it, uh, I've always assumed, or I've been assuming for the last little while, that that was our Tobias. Now the other part of the story was, and the other part of the tragedy is, is that when he got, when the family got to Hamilton, or they got to, to, to Canada, they, had, they got correspondence that said that Tobias had been killed. So the mother and, and at least two of the brothers packed up and they, they went to where he was killed. They had the body, um, they had the body exhumed because the mother, who was, who was the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the big stick behind, behind that, she wanted to make sure, first of all, it was him. She wanted to make sure that, that what they said killed him. Was uh, was what killed him, because she was they were because of, of his experiences with the with the uh, with with what happened in Tipperary and why he had to leave. They thought that the British were pursuing him and and, and might have taken him up, take, taken him out. Now that's kind of a it seems like a, a bit of a, a fanciful story in itself, but there was the only Tobias that death record that I can find is a death record for Tobias that died in New Jersey in 1849. Now that is quite likely our Tobias, not have yet to be able to confirm that, but, but according to family lore again, he, was, he died because he, he died from a kick to the head from a horse, which in those days was quite a common death for a, a lot of people. Now, Thomas Stapleton, early in the, in the process, left the family and headed out on his own. The good news was his daughters, daughters Bridget and, and, and Mary got married, as well as their son John, and the, the birth of their first grandchildren happened in the first decade. Another sad note was that, that James Stapleton was born about 1783, and the, and the father of the group and, and a member of the, of the, uh, the family that, that came from Ireland died from pneumonia in 1859. And then upon the death of, of, of the father, the ownership of, of, the father, of the property that the father had passed to his son, Matthew. Now, this is an escape. You've seen that picture, that uh, map I had before. There was a little green box. And that represents this area here in Enniskillen Township. And I'll quickly go through these. these th this is the land that they acquired, and, and basically the, the time scenario that, uh, that they acquired it in. So in 1852-53, um, both John here, who got the first lot, and his father and his brother James bought bought two more 100-acre 100 100 acre farms in, in Enniskillen Township. In 18, in, by 1854, um, it remained the same. 1855, after Michael O'Neill and, and Mary got married, my, they bought, they bought a, a, an adjoining property uh, in, this, in, this, in the same area. 1856 and 57, again, the uh, additional property was, was, uh, was procured. And then 1858 to 1863, sons Martin and Stephen also acquired property in the next, in the next uh, concession over. Now, the second decade. Margaret Gleason died in 1861. Um, as I said before, there was there was two more farms uh, purchased. The son, the, the youngest son, Stephen, 
kind of kind of disappears from the record as well. The only confirmation that that we that we have that he actually died was a letter from letter from Valley Hiskey back to uh, to uh, his brother Martin that's that confirming that he died in 1866. The letter and the the letter was dated November of 18. Uh, 1870 that and and uh, uh, we know that it, it also confirms in that same letter that their daughter Bridget had died so 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 some, somewhere in 1866 Stephen died and Bridget died in November of 1868 of childbirth Martin Gleason married a, or met and married a, a, a young gal from that was living in Michigan and uh, then he, after after his uh, after his marriage, he moved to where her family was in Kanaki Township in Saint Clair County, Michigan. The third decade, several grandchildren uh, moved to Michigan looking for industri industrial work and land. A lot of people didn't want to be farmers. Um, and then in eight, somewhere between 1877 and 1881, Mary and her husband Michael O'Neill moved to St. Clair County, basically following their children. And uh, they, they ended up uh, purchasing land and, and lived very closely to where their brother Martin and his children lived. It, it's amazing, but <clears throat> the family, even though they were separated uh, not only by uh, a, a national boundary, which was a, a river in, in that particular case, but it really wasn't a, a boundary other than the fact that it was a river. Uh, they actually managed as a, as a group between the Enniskillen Township crowd and the Michigan crowd. They, they still operated as a, a family unit, and, and uh, between the, the larger group, they, they had a fairly successful uh, droving business, uh, moving both sheep and cattle uh, to, to the stockyards in, uh, in Buffalo and the stockyards in Chicago. Uh, fourth decade, my great, or my grand, my great grandfather, uh, John, uh, passes away in 1889 from pneumonia. And his farm was later purchased by his eldest son, James, from his mother, and she, and she then moved into the town of Petrolia. Mary Kerwin, who was actually from Tulla Parish in County Clare, um, she passed away of liver disease in 1893. And a few years later, James Stapleton, who at the age, at the age of 75, then sells his farm uh, and to, my, to my grandfather, John Stapleton, and moved with his children to Homestead to basically pack up and emigrate one more time and he moved to McBride Lake District near Fort McLeod in southern Alberta, and uh, which I, you know, in, in, in those days it was it, it was a, a 75 year old man picking up his seven or eight children and and their wives and children and and, uh, and their grandchildren and and moving uh, to Alberta, you know, 3,500 miles away was quite a feat of logistics, and, and, it, and that was really enabled by the fact that there was now a transcontinental train that was able to take them, you know, from Sarnia, or from, from that area, out to, out to Alberta to, to, to take on that land. They actually owned about, uh, by 1930, they had, uh, they had almost 100,000 acres of, of land uh, that, that they controlled. That's a, and, uh, that's a picture of James actually, and uh, and his and his family that was taken just prior to they moved in 1901, and I and I threw a couple of uh, this and this is the this is the house that they moved to or they built in McBride Lake after they moved there in uh, in 1901, and of course they you know they were they were out there in the wild wild west right so. That was actually a chuck wagon they had that uh, that uh, supported their their cattle business uh, uh, in Alberta. This is this is actually the, this is the same family, but it's the house it's the house that they that they sold to uh, that they lived in that they sold 
to my uh, to my grandfather when they left. And uh, my house, my my dad had, had fond memories of this house. It was quite a, it, it was quite a large house, and uh, but uh, it burned down in 1921. And uh, my my dad was uh, the one that discovered the fire, and uh, they, they actually managed to get everything out of the house before before it uh, before it uh, completely burned down. And it actually the house was so well built, and it was timber frame construction. It took all day to burn down. <laughs> this is Matt uh, Gleason's family. Matt Gleason. Matt Stapleton. Matt Stapleton is, is, is an interesting character because his wife, Margaret, oops, his wife, Margaret, who is sitting next to him in the chair here, and this picture was also taken in 1901 by the, likely the same photographer that took the other picture, um, they were first cousins, and uh, of course they had to get dispensation from uh, from the local bishop to, to marry. And uh, and uh, his mother's his his uncle his his wife's father was Pat Gleason, and his mother was Catherine O'Brien. Catherine was from Drummond in Burgess Parish. The fourth decade and beyond. Mary Stapleton O'Neill passed, passes in 1892 and her husband Michael O'Neill in 1899. Thomas Stapleton passed away in 1894 and his wife Harriet Playford in, in 1893. Thomas had actually uh, apprenticed as a, as a wagon maker and uh, after he left the family early on and he uh, he, 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 he ended up working as, as a wagon maker for his wife's uh, father, and that's, uh, and that's how, how, he, how he met Harriet. And, uh, but, you know, they, they died within a year of one another, and it was really a broken heart that, uh, that killed Thomas as well, because he was never really the same after Harriet died. Martin Stapleton passed away in 1893, and his wife Mary Dunnigan in, the, in 1912. James Stapleton Jr. passed in, in, in 1908 after, at Fort McLeod after moving out there in 1901. The last but not least, the last of the, of the Ballyhiskey crowd <clears throat> that passed away in 1923 um, after his wife predeceased, his wife Margaret, uh, his first cousin predeceased him in 1916. My father was actually at that funeral. And he, and, he, and he remembers it because Matt was laying, Matt was laying on, uh, he was laying in the coffin and he had, a, he had a white shirt on it. And like all men in those days, he had that, uh, you've seen pictures, the, the, the picture of him before, he was one of those Irish guys that had the white beard. And uh, they were all pipe smokers. And my dad remembers seeing his shirt with, with the holes in it from where the, the, the where the ash from the pipe would burn the holes in their shirts. <laughs> That's basically the end of the big, uh, end of the beginning. I really, I really don't have anything more to say. There's a, there's a few shots here of uh, that we have uh, of the of the original crew, though. And uh, this guy looks like a Gleason, but that's Matt. That's Matt Stapleton. And of course, is you know it, it's and and this is him as as a young man with uh, with with Margaret and and two and two of their, their their first children. This is Thomas Stapleton, and this is his son Mortimer. This is Mary Kerwin or and Mary Kerwin here. This is James. Uh, this I believe this is James Stapleton when he was a little younger. This is James Stapleton when he was older. This is Martin Stapleton and Mary Dunnigan. And I think this is John Stapleton and Mary Hubbard, his wife. Not sure. This is Father James, or became Monsignor James Stapleton, the son of Martin Stapleton and, and Mary Dunnigan. He, he, he built and, or he, he, he built the, the, the Parish of Annunciation 
in Detroit, and he was its pastor from from its opening in 1909, I think it was, until 1942 when he passed away. And that's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And a quick question for Mike. I think it's amazing that you have so many fantastic photographs because we don't have photographs like this in our family. And I just wonder whether there are some families that are photographic orientators and other families that don't have that kind of... Uh, well, that's about it right there. <laughs> well, we have many photographs. These, these are actually tin types, you know, so they're just little wee small metal-backed uh, metal back photographs and uh, although they're ver ver really really clear you can blow them up you can pull details out of them it's phenomenal and uh, but that's pretty well it for a legacy I mean there's, there's modern photographs beyond that but these are actually from the from the this picture here like this picture here might be 1858. Wow, okay. That's going back quite a Yeah. Long. And th this, this one here would be 1864, probably. Okay. Yeah. Well, these are the 1870s. Legacy. Like that yeah. That kind of heritage. Great. Well, listen, I'm very conscious of time. We've had a fantastic day. We've had some great speakers uh, talking about the various decent immigrants to all the four corners of the world. And at 8 o'clock this evening, we have the Justice for Harry Gleason group coming in to talk to us about their particular work. So can I ask you to give a warm hand for my favorite and his story of the Canadian immigration. Thank you very much. See you all back here at 8 o'clock this evening. So go and find some dinner and we will reconvene in due course. <laughs>